Welcome back to Ali Atrévete a lo Imposible, Season 2, Episode 6. Today we have <laughs> Ashley Rojas. I appreciate you taking the time from our conversation that we've had prior to this episode. Um, I feel the passion and I feel the strength. And it is very admirable and it is very inspira- inspir- inspiring. I feel so inspired, as I mentioned. It's a very interesting chapter of my life. So to be able to hear someone that is extremely self-aware and intentional is very, very motivating in terms of like my personal growth as a person. So I really appreciate Aww, that. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So... You are from, you're born in Chicago, and I'll let you tell this part of your story. Yeah, so I was born in Chicago, but I've been in South Carolina since before I turned one. So I really have grown up in South Carolina, Goose Creek specifically, um, as you know, is about 20, 25 minutes from downtown Charleston, but um, I've lived there my whole life. Mm. I was raised in Goose Creek. Where are your parents from? My dad is from Mexico. My mom's from Ecuador. Mm. How has how have you connected with both identities? Um, it really is hard because we don't have extended family in South Carolina. We have, I think, I have a couple of uncles and aunts in in New York and Chicago. But here in South Carolina, it's always just been my immediate family. So really, our traditions are just what our family does. Um, I never grew up eating very Mexican. My mom hates tortillas and like mm. bread. Uh, she's a very much very rice girl. Mm. If you're from Ecuador, you know, like rice goes for like, with every meal. And I think I've taken that a lot. I like having rice in almost all my meals. Like it's a staple. Um, I'm not huge into bread. Like I don't eat tortas or anything. Mm. There's too much. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but I like some spice still. Uh, I did get that from both my parents. But it's it's definitely... It's definitely tough, and especially in South Carolina, where I think it's been growing a lot, the Latin community, but overall, unless you have a lot of family or you're intentionally really growing that community, Mm -hmm. you don't see much of it. So really, what I knew with my cultures was just what I grew up with. Mm. So you went to Stratford High School, Mm -hmm. uh, graduated in 2018 now, yeah. Mm. What are you up to now? So I am a second year PhD student in economics at the University of South Carolina. And you got your bachelor's in? Uh, Economics in South Carolina as Mm. as well. So you've been living in Columbia for quite some time. Yeah, since I graduated high school, I moved up here in 2018, did my undergrad, uh, graduated a semester early, and then started grad school in Columbia. So I haven't left. Why economics? Ah, uh, long story. <laughs> um, it really, I had no idea what, what economics was before high school. I took an AP microeconomics class and I didn't want to even take that class. I took it because it was AP, um, but I really wanted to take AP Gov because I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school. I knew I had to go to college. That was always emphasized by my parents. Um But I didn't know what I wanted to study. And I think we get pulled in a lot by our personal experiences and what we see around us. And even though my parents are legal residents in the country, a lot of the people they knew weren't. They were undocumented. And I think because of that exposure I got, I was really interested in immigration. And I really wanted to do law school and be an immigration lawyer. And so in high school, I wasn't really thinking too much about what major because I I knew I wanted to do law school, but I couldn't figure out the major. Um, And I was still just trying to figure things out. But I wanted to take AP Gov because I knew that that would be good if I want to do law school. But the thing with how it worked at Stratford was for you to take AP Gov, you had to take AP Econ too because they were semester long. So AP Gov was in the fall and AP Econ was in the spring. Um, And I remember when I decided to do this, I was talking to one of my teachers and I just suck at math. I've always been so bad at math. I can't say I suck at math anymore. I'm doing a PhD f- with math. <laughs> but I've always, it's always been something that's taken me a lot of work. And I think a lot of it goes down to my undiagnosed ADHD. And I really do think I have some kind of math learning disability. I haven't got, gotten tested for that. I think it's 
kind of hard at the level I'm at now to get tested for that. But I've always struggled with math. And my teacher told me, it was like, you can do the AP econ class, but just know it's going to be math and you're going to struggle a little with that. And so I decided to do it anyway. And I was like, I'll figure it out once I get to spring semester. I'll take other easy classes. So Mm -hmm. that's fine. But I ended up really liking it. And the big thing with economics is the normal econ class they offered at my school that was an AP was the basic one that like everyone needed to graduate I think everyone needed some semester of economics to graduate high school but it wasn't economics it was like how to write a check and you know financial stuff and that's not what economics is uh but so when I took AP the way my teacher explained it to us was I think what really kind of pulled me in at first and he just said economics is the study of human behavior and under scarcity and I think that's what I really liked about it because I knew I liked topics with psychology and things about how humans act and why they act the way they do and what leads them to do that I've always been interested in that and I like kind of psychology topics but I knew I didn't want to major in psychology and go down that right route and so I thought of economics as being a way to study human behavior and kind of have some of that psychology in it kind of but with the economy and scarcity that you have in an economy and I really liked it and I told myself okay at this point I think I applied to USC as a criminal justice major just because I knew I needed a major to get in and I didn't know what to do and I know everyone thinks that that's what you should do for law school even though it's it's not really I don't even think the top major that gets Mm -hmm. into law school but I just picked something, submitted the application. Uh, But as I took the AP econ class, it was tough. Don't get me wrong. It's something that it's a new subject, right? It's not like you started learning it from elementary school and it's just like another math class, right? No, it's it's different. And you have to think about it differently than other subjects you've been taught in the past. And it took a while for me to like get into it and understand it. And I always struggled in it. I had to study a lot. But I told myself, if I pass AP exam, I'll switch my major in undergrad to economics. Um, Because I knew that, as my teacher said, that the major if you were to study in college required a good amount of math. Um, But it could be really good for jobs in the future. And so I knew that I needed to go to college and I knew that I need to get a job that makes money. So I said, "Mm, okay, let me study economics Mm -hmm. since I couldn't think of anything else. And on orientation day of USC, when I went in to just, I don't know, I can't remember what you do on orientation, but I just went um, and I switched my major Mm -hmm. to econ, had no idea what I was getting myself into and switched it. Mm. Did you ever question whether economics was the right major to study? Yeah. Yeah. Even to this day, sometimes I still question it when I'm overwhelmed. I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me, right? (laughs) Um, But in undergrad specifically, so I got into this major, right? (laughs) It took my first econ class. So I took micro in high school, right? So I started taking uh, macro. That was my first econ class in college. And I had the worst experience. Mm. Um, My macro professor was like the meanest guy Mm. to this day that I've had in economics. (laughs) Um, I, I actually had him again as a professor in grad school. And it was just traumatic all over again (laughs) but uh I remember actually he he's Hispanic uh he's a Hispanic man I remember trying to relate to him and being like oh my mom's from Ecuador like the countries are you know neighbors and he was just like okay (laughs) okay but I just it was such a tough class and it's funny because a couple months ago actually I looked at my group me and I still have the class from that semester and looking at the messages about how everyone everyone felt the same way Mm. but it was a lot tougher than it should have been for an intro to macro class. But I think that's when I realized macro is not my thing. The GDP stuff, the interest rates, inflation, it was a world that I was never exposed to. Um, My parents don't have the best financial literacy in the world. And I mean, it's amazing what they've gotten us to, to this point, me and my siblings. Um, But we didn't grow up with like knowing that you get Roth IRAs and all of these different things. And I just felt when I started these classes, I had no idea what these, like the interest rate, I just didn't understand the topics. And it was something that felt so distant to me and I wasn't really liking it. And I was just, "Mm, do I want to study this? 
Um, and then I got into the intermediate level classes and that's when it gets math heavy. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start doing a lot of calculus and that's where it's kind of, it's almost like the weaning out courses, Mm -hmm. um, for economics. And I struggled, but I studied a lot. And the reason I did super well in my intermediate micro class was because I had a great TA and she was amazing. And she would hold review sessions before exams and just, I would study so hard everything she went through and just redid problems over and over again. Uh, And I ended up doing really well in the class, but the teacher, the professor specifically of that class, uh, she's now today the director of the economics department at USC. And I built a really great relationship relationship with her in in the intermediate class. Um, I was the same way in high school. I've always been like, really close to my teachers Mm -hmm. um I think a lot of it does come from that having no direction having no guidance on what to do and my parents of course I can't really ask them for advice because they had they don't even speak the language they don't really know what I'm doing in school and teachers really became my mentors um and she became a really big mentor for me and After I took her class, she, it was my end of sophomore year of undergrad, and she sent me an email a week before this application was due. And it was for the AEA, which is the American Economic Association. And they're the big deal, right? Like the AEA is the top of econ. Um, They're like the top journal. They're the it thing. And they have a summer program for underrepresented groups in economics, studying economics. And they have two different levels. It's foundations and advanced. Um. But she sent me this email about that summer program for that year. So it would have been summer of 2020. And she told me, if you want to apply for this, I'll write you your recommendation like right away. I know that this is short notice, but this is a really great opportunity and I think you should do it. And when I looked into the program, this program is geared towards preparing these underrepresented students from um, that are studying economics, but it's to help them kind of geared towards grad school Mm -hmm. and grad school was never on my horizon I had no idea what a PhD was until the end of sophomore year of undergrad Mm. um I I knew it was a doctorate but I didn't see the value in it I guess I because I didn't know what research was and so I really didn't want to do this program and I I decided to apply because I wanted to stay on the on a good side with my mentor. I Mm -hmm. thought I want her to see like I'm putting an effort and I'm Mm -hmm. doing well and hopefully she'll keep writing me letters for jobs and stuff Mm -hmm. after undergrad and did this program. And I think it was the first time that I realized just how rare it was for underrepresented groups to be in economics and it was just a really really amazing opportunity it was an eight week long program and they pay you I got Mm. I got thousands of dollars for doing this econ thing like I had to do econ all summer and I got paid thousands of dollars to do this Mm. and it was it was pretty hard it was pretty demanding but um it exposed me to just the the work it takes to do a PhD in economics. And I realized, okay, I don't want to do that. Like, this is not for me. I've worked really hard this summer, but like, I'm still just so different from these people because even though it was a program geared for people like me, you know, people who are entering economics later in life, you know, because at this point for you to like go into a good econ PhD program, you have to have done really really amazing undergrad majoring not only in economics but also in math at the least or at least have taken these really high level math classes like real analysis and I wasn't going to do all that right I, I was almost done with grad school at this point um I mean with undergrad I had taken most of my heavy classes and I just I was like I'm not doing that and these people in the program we would have these big economists come talk to us I had no idea who these people were and everyone else knew them. They'd get excited like, oh, I can't believe doctor, this person is Mm -hmm. coming to talk to us. They do this kind of research. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about. And I think that was me realizing, okay, this isn't for me. And I thought there, there was like a hint of inspiration because I had 
really great people who came and talked to us and explained their situation to us and how they got into economics. And it was inspiring, of course, but I still didn't have that, my own passion for it, I don't think. And I still didn't want to completely like throw it out of sight. And so when I started that following fall back at USC, since I pretty much was almost done with all the classes I needed to take, I decided, I guess as fun to take Calc 3 as an elective, Mm. not in my major or anything. Uh, For the Bachelors of Science of Economics that I did, you only have to go up to Calc 2. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to do Calc 3 to see if I could do it and be like, well, if it's not too bad, then maybe I could do grad school. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, it was during COVID and we had just gone back in person, but I think, I don't know if we were sent back home or I can't remember the class went online at some point. Mm -hmm. And that really threw me off. But I realized this is hard. I don't understand vectors. I don't know what I'm doing with this math. I'm Mm -hmm. awful at math. What was I thinking? Mm -hmm. And I remembered. I was like, it's because I'm not good at math. So what was I thinking? And I I, I passed a class. It was a pass or fail class. And so I just passed it. And then that's when it was, okay, for sure not doing grad school. And then I think it was about, it was the fall of my senior year of undergrad. So it's the fall of... 2021 and I went to my advisement it's like I'm really out of classes to take I could do another semester and take grad level classes to get exposure to that if I wanted to do a master's but I already decided I don't even want to do a master's um I knew that master's they're pretty much not funded so I'd have to pay for that myself I already had some loans from undergrad I didn't want to do more I was tired I was burnt out I wanted a break and I didn't I knew I didn't want to do that. And so I decided to graduate a semester early. And so I graduated and I'm applying for jobs. And I realized like none of these jobs were really economics. And the things I liked from economics were from classes that were electives in the behavioral economics classes and the economics of terrorism. Those were the classes that were like, oh, this is really kind of cool. Mm. And all of the jobs were like financial analyst or whatever it is. And I know you do that, but I was like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I don't know how to take care of my own money. I don't want to be, <laughs> don't put me in charge of someone else's money. Yeah. Uh, and I did not want to do that. And so I, went through like pretty bad depression I think figuring when I graduated because I had no idea what I wanted to do I was unhappy I realized that up to that point it was just the next thing right what's the next thing that's what I'm working towards I knew all through middle school high school I need to go to college so work for college Mm -hmm. I got to college it's like okay do well and do well get a high GPA so you can get a good job and then I did the college thing and it's like well I don't like anything Like anything I'm Mm. applying to, I don't like any of this. And I realized, oh my God, I don't even know who I am. I don't know what I like. What did I do these last Mm -hmm. four years? And it just put me in a really bad place, I think. Um, And I got an email early that spring from my mentor, who was my intermediate micro professor, who encouraged me to apply to this program. And I think she always felt some inclination towards me because she's a woman. She's a Turkish woman in economics. And I think she's really had to work really hard to get to where she's at. Mm -hmm. And I think she saw that I had potential. She knew I was really good at working hard. She knew I was going to make an A in her class because I needed an A. Mm -hmm. And she knew I went to office hours and asked for help. And she just saw I cared. And so she emailed me and she's like, Hey, I really think we should talk again. She had already talked to me junior year about potentially doing grad school. And I Mm -hmm. told her straight up, I said, Nope, not doing it. Um, but I was in a really bad place. I was applying to a couple jobs. I didn't want them anyway. So I was like, what's, what's the hurt and just talking to her. And so I went to talk to her and she pretty much told me that I should really consider doing the PhD program at the university that, you know, I graduated and did my uh, undergrad in and that she would be there to support me and help me through each step. And that, yes, it's scary, but she thinks that I could do it. And the big thing that she told me was 
like, Ashley, you don't even know the doors that this can open up for you. And I really did. I was like, yeah, I don't because everything seems hard. I don't want to do any of that. (laughs) Um, And I still didn't really understand what research was. Like, I still didn't see how I could study some of these topics that I was interested in and how they even related to economics. Mm -hmm. Um, And it took a couple months of me still applying to a couple places and trying to figure out what to do. And she kept emailing me like, have you thought more about this? I really think you should do this. And that's when I think it was about May, maybe when I was like, I have no other option at this point than to take this opportunity. And I think the reason I think what a lot of people don't know about a PhD, especially in a PhD of economics is you don't accept an offer for a school unless it's fully funded. Mm -hmm. And that's something people do not know. They do not know that like, there's a possibility of a PhD being fully funded. And um, not only is it fully funded, but you get a stipend on top of that to live off of. It's not much. It's not even very livable if that's the only thing you're relying on. Mm -hmm. But you get money to learn because you're not supposed to have any other job, right? This is your job. Mm -hmm. You're working for this school. They're paying you. Um, And I needed a job. So I was like, I might as well just do this program in the meantime. And if I hate it, then I master out and get a, I get a, fr- I get a free masters out of it. If I hate it, if I suck, if it's not for me, then I can leave and I leave with a free masters degree because I didn't have a masters at this point. And that's when I said, okay, let's do it. Um, and then I started my PhD and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that there were some moments in your teenage years or in your early childhood? that you see looking back now that could have influenced your career in economics? I think um, my whole life has influenced why I'm studying what I am. And I didn't know it at the moment, obviously, but everything I'm interested in studying in economics in some way comes from my experiences. And I think that's what makes what has created so much passion for me in those interests because it's something personal and it's something I really care about. And the fact that I can potentially study that at a PhD level, write a dissertation on it is kind of insane to me. Um, I haven't narrowed in specifically my research topic yet, but Broadly speaking, my research interests are education policy, um, specifically geared towards underrepresented groups, topics of identity, and most recently, my biggest, uh, the what I've been putting most of my effort into recently has been migration. And not only do I care about, you know, the enforcement effects of, for undocumented immigrants, but specifically within migration, I'm interested in Uh, intergenerational mobility and labor market outcomes and I've been just doing a lot of literature reading on that recently and I think it all just comes from a place of based on the odds I shouldn't be in this program I shouldn't be where I'm at right now Mm. Um, less than two percent of the U.S. population has a PhD Mm -hmm. most of them are not women and they're not women of color Mm especially in a field like economics. Um, I actually saw that not too long ago that even among some of the STEM uh, graduate degrees you can get, economics is one of the ones that is still the most, uh, still has the most men in it, has like no women, especially no women of color. Uh, And I think it makes sense now being exposed to what academia is and what this process is like and, and how demanding it can be. It makes sense why those numbers are the way they are. And it makes sense how everything based off of my my past, based off of my parents' education, based off of everything that happened in elementary school, middle school, I shouldn't be where I'm at right now. I did not I do not have the sufficient experience to be where I'm at and yet here I am um but based off of averages that's not true right and I think that's what really brings me into economics is because 
it's not what people think it is. You know, everyone thinks that economics is banking and stocks and it's none of that. And mm -hmm. you could specialize in that. Of course, you could focus in on that in an economic way, of course. But that's not what I care about. Um, I care about the social issues and just policy and making things better uh, for underrepresented groups. Uh, and a lot of what I'm passionate about really is focused around what I saw growing up or what I was exposed to. Mm. And I think some people think that's bad. I think some people think it's not good to tie in your personal life too much into your what you study or what you research. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think if you're truly passionate about something, um, a specific topic, it's only going to make it make your work better. Yeah. So I'm happy that I finally found that. Mm. <laughs> what have you learned about yourself through through the PhD program, but also through, I guess, your academic career? Yeah. Well, like I said, until grad school, it's always been just what's the next thing? I know I need to get to the next thing. Uh, and it was never really focusing on what is it that I'm interested in? What do I like? What do I want to do? I never knew what I really like to do. And um, I think that's a common occurrence for people mm. from our backgrounds that, you know, you've got to get to the next thing. But your parents, for a lot of our parents, I think they lived a life of survival mode mm. where they didn't have the privilege or the luxury to care about just their wants. Right. It's not what would I like to do? Who cares? I need to work and make a living. Right. Mm. And I think that that's what they could do. Right. Like that's what they knew. That's what they could do. And they did great with what they could do. But the jump that they made, at least the jump that I've seen in my parents, what they had to do to like get me to where I'm at right now, that is just one generation and I'm astounded by just what my dad my mom had to do to put me in this life right how vastly different their lives were compared to mine mm. and so now it's my job to now do more with that right so maybe I didn't grow up learning what my interests are but now I got to figure that out right because they couldn't teach me that but you have to learn it on your own and I don't, I don't know. I think I've learned, I've learned more in this past year than I think I have ever learned about myself. I, re like I said, going into the first year, I was way, way in over my head. Like I had no idea what I was getting into. Going in, taking an econometrics PhD level mm. course, uh, mm. When I took econometrics in undergrad during COVID, every single exam, like I didn't know the information. It was all open book. It was all online. Like I didn't ever learn anything. And now mm -hmm. here I am not only doing econometrics, but doing it in vector notation, matrix notation. Mm -hmm. So not only am I having to understand what I'm doing, but I'm doing it in like a math level that I, I didn't, I've never even taken matrix, mm -hmm. matrix uh, calculus. And so... I've never taken linear algebra and I was going into this not only learning the material but having to learn how to do the math to be able to do the material and I felt like that every single day first year I think and I cried a lot it was a constant feeling of like I'm really not meant to do this and this isn't for me because mm -hmm. Everyone says well if you're passionate about it then that's all that matters but at that point I didn't even know I had any passion for it because it was all just unknown to me. It mm -hmm. was just all so scary and so big and so unknown. And everything was, there's no way I'm going to learn this. I am so behind. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think it's really hard when you are a first gen student, especially at the graduate level, because this is your job. Like, not only are you in school, but this is your job. And you're not just a student. It's a process of turning you from a receiver of education mm -hmm. into someone who produces it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my parents didn't understand that the I was taking only three, three classes a semester. And they thought, well, that's better. You used to take like four. 
but there's a reason you're only taking yeah. three. Um, and there's a reason that people, you know, don't sleep in grad school or it's just, it's a world that they don't, they don't know much about. And I felt very unsupported at times mentally, I think. And because of that, I felt like I needed to create my own support system. And I had to really, really rely on professors and my peers around me because they were the only ones who actually kind of understood what I was going through. And I, ha I had to also learn that just because my parents aren't supporting me in the way I want them to doesn't mean that they aren't supporting me in the best way that they know. And that was a really hard reality because at first it caused me to just be very, it felt like I was mourning like my, my life, everything. I kept questioning if only my parents knew I had ADHD as a kid, right? Maybe mm -hmm. if I had been medicated earlier on, then math wouldn't have been so hard for me and I would have learned it better and it would have made me overall better at math and then I would have actually been good at math for my grad program and it would have been better. Mm -hmm. So it was just constantly, like I was constantly raveling down these thoughts of if only these things would have done, but would have gone differently and I would have been better in other aspects. And it's just such a vicious cycle because there's absolutely nothing you can do about that at this point. You know, mm -hmm. the way you grew up is the way you grew up and it's your experiences and you can't change that. And you, you, you can't just stay stuck living in that past of, or in that, those thoughts of what could this have been if it was differently. And I think that was a lot of my first year was mm -hmm. constantly questioning everything and being just so upset that like, this is so unfair. And if only things had been differently, mm -hmm. I would have been better prepared. And I was just angry. I was mm -hmm. really angry, I think. And it was hard, right? Because, you know, you can't blame your parents because they can only do what they could with what they knew. And that's all they knew. But the, at the same time, it was just so upsetting knowing how unfair this was that I was so behind that I'm, struggling as much as I am because I wasn't exposed to this earlier. And it took me a lot to get out of that headspace. It took a lot. Um, it took a lot of just being more self-aware, being more intentional and like wanting to do better every day. Um, and I just, I look back at that year and I just see so many waves of highs and lows. And it was just every day, literally. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say every day was hard. Every day I was exposed to something new. Everything I was learning was new. And it was scary. And it just seemed so unfair to me. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting journey being a first-generation college student, I couldn't, I, from an undergraduate standpoint, I couldn't imagine, I can't really imagine what it was like, you know, being a PDH, P, uh, P, a PDH, sorry, P, PhD candidate um, and being in these courses that are extremely advanced with individuals that have been exposed to some of this earlier. Um I just, I like can't, I can't really wrap my, my head around it. How would you describe your state of mind now? I would say I'm in, oh, in a much better place. Um, so I think in a perfect world, I, I wouldn't say I don't recommend what I did going straight into a PhD from undergrad. I think it's possible if you really want it. Had things been differently, this would not have been the course I, I took. I think I was in a state of really just burnout from the start anyway. I was burnt out from undergrad. I was really immature because here's the thing, like not only are you at this new level, but like you have to transition into, it's not the same as college. It's not the same. Even if you have classes, everything, everything is different because like I said, this really is your job now. Um, 
And even if I would, I could have done a year long master's just to give myself that, that time to transition, I think would have been helpful. And I think there's a reason people go work for a little while before they do a grad program, if it's possible. Because I think when you're that young, when you're 22, going into a PhD program, being first gen, not knowing a single thing you're getting into, like that is such a scary thing. Mm. And of course, like I said, it is possible, but it is so, so hard. And I wouldn't say that a master's program would necessarily make me better at economics. Mm -hmm. Like one year preparation wouldn't have automatically made me, you know, 10, 20% better than what I'm doing now. But just allowing yourself to slowly transition into it. Because for me, the biggest, biggest thing was everything was so overwhelming. Every aspect. Just how how to manage being a grad school student and how to manage the workload and how to manage my whole life outside of that. How do I eat? How do I sleep? Like, mm. it was constantly times where I was like, I'm skipping dinner because I'm going to bed. It's just so much being thrown at once. And the big thing with the econ PhD is at least at my department is first year classes grades don't matter um what matters is the big exam you take uh in the middle of summer which are your qualifying exams and essentially if you don't pass those exams you're out of the program you have to pass those exams to continue into the PhD and so I remember when we were taking our classes our professor said it doesn't matter what you make on these exams I doesn't matter what grade you make everyone's grade's going to be fine after this just you have to pass the exam and like when I'm saying I struggled first year I struggled I made my lowest grade was a 10 out of 100 on an exam that was my grade and I made a c plus in the class because it's just a whole different level in grad school. It's not normal school. Mm -hmm. They kind of make their own rules. And when it was time to start studying for the exams, that's when I really realized there were times first year where I gave up on myself, um, specifically in macro. So the qualifying exams, there were four exams, two were in micro, two were in macro, Mm -hmm. because you took in the fall, micro, macro, and metrics. And then in the spring, you took micro, macro, and metrics, but part two of those classes. Mm-hmm. And so the exams luckily didn't cover econometrics, but they covered both the micro classes and both the macro classes. And like I said, I knew macro was never my thing. And macro at the PhD level is insane. <laughs> um, it's insane. And I I gave up on myself a lot of times. I didn't work as hard as I should have. I should have studied more and I didn't. I would often avoid it because that's how much I hated it. I knew I couldn't do it. And I think in a way my brain believed it that I wouldn't even try at times. And so I was studying for these exams in the beginning of June, you know, I'm like one or two weeks away from my exams. And I realized this really, it's hard, don't get me wrong, but if I had just put a little bit more effort, it, I could do, I know I could do a little bit better. Like I could have learned more of this. And I felt so, so upset at myself when it was time for the exams. Cause I felt like I cheated myself. I quit so many times throughout the year earlier than I should have when all it took was trying a little bit more, just doing something, doing a little something. And I couldn't do it sometimes. And I really feel like I missed out on some of my learning because of my own brain telling me I couldn't do it. And I think that's what really frustrated me. And I told myself, okay, if I pass these exams and then like, I can't keep letting this imposter syndrome take over my life. Mm -hmm. Like I need to realize if I pass these exams then I'm meant to be here Mm -hmm. and let me try. Well, I pass the exams and that doesn't happen. I was still, well, they just let me pass because they think I might be good at research. So they're just going to see what happens, but they don't really think I should have passed because I know I failed at least one or two of those exams. Like I know I didn't pass them all. And, you know, everyone's saying, Ashley, no, they pass you for a reason. Like they're not just going to pass you to pass you. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. you have to pass the exams. And the thing is they have a whole committee that goes through these exams. Like it's not just one person who's determining your grade the professor grades your exams but then if there needs to be more conversations if maybe you're on the borderline of 
uh, failing. They'll talk with other professors that you had that semester. They talk about your other work because you're a TA and a research assistant. So you're a teacher, you're a teaching assistant and you're a research assistant. And, you know, you're also working with these other professors in those classes and helping to proctor exams for undergrads and tutoring undergrads. And so sometimes it'll help if you did really well with some of those things to show them, okay, maybe this exam wasn't the best, but she has potential. It shows that she would do well with the teaching aspect, all of these things. And so I really was just convinced they let me pass because they just, they just let me pass. I don't think I meant, I'm, I'm meant to be here still or anything. And so I think the rest of the summer was still me not even celebrating really my win because I still just felt like I didn't deserve it. And I got into group therapy in the summer. I started doing that a lot and it was really talking to people, talking to, especially in my group therapy, it's adults, like really older adults. They're in their forties, some are even their sixties, um, who have experienced a lot more life than I have. But it was just constantly being told by these people, like, Ashley, you realize what you're doing is insane. Like, you are so self-aware and you are trying every day to just get better. Like, why are you so tough on yourself? You deserve every opportunity that's given to you. And I'm like, these these are strangers. Like, they can't all be lying to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I kind of realized, like, okay, like, maybe there's maybe it's not just all luck, right? And I would tell my boyfriend and I would cry to him because I still felt like I wasn't good enough for this. And he said, Ashley, when is it going to finally be enough? Like, when are you going to finally complete enough things for you to feel like you deserve it? Because Mm -hmm. when you do something good, it's luck and you don't deserve that. But when you up, you always say it's on you. So... I don't understand how that's possible. How can every good thing that happened to you be luck, but every bad thing be because of you? Like, at what point is it in, is it going to be enough for you? At what point are you going to let yourself celebrate any of this? Is it going to be by the point you get, at the point that you get your PhD? Is it going to be when you graduate? Is it when you're going to have a job? When are you finally going to feel happy with what you've done? And it just that hit me like a truck because I was just like, you're, yeah, you're so right because it's not at this point. I just passed these huge exams that I could never, ever think of passing. And it's like, I don't care because I don't think it's, it means anything. And I think that's when I kind of try to flip a switch this year and was very much on the, let me just try a little bit at a day, a little bit each day take it one day at a time and see what happens and luckily second year classes are a lot better better um I'm everything I'm learning is still pretty new like these are these are new topics that I haven't been exposed to but it's a lot more manageable than what first year was and I think it's taken seeing the hard work finally pay off like I can finally see my progress first year everything was so overwhelming everything was so new that it just felt like I was running in circles there was nothing that was getting better and it's like now I see just how much I have actually learned like (laughs) who I was last July as in July of 2022 that's a completely different person. And I think when you're in this PhD program, you're forced to face all of you. You're forced to look at all of the good. You're forced at looking at all of the bad because that's, that's all that's in front of you at this point. Everyone's struggling. Everyone thinks this is hard. Right. And so you see what works and you really see what's not working in your life. And that on top of just what I felt like was a mourning process for everything that of what could have been had things been differently it was exhausting and I think I've just been very much on a more peaceful level like I am finally at peace with the chaos I am okay with knowing that every day is going to be tough I'm okay with knowing that most of what I'm learning is new and it's going to take weeks months years to learn and get really good at this and like that's okay Mm. because what I want to study what I want to do 
it's going to take my whole life to get really good at. Mm -hmm. And I was never okay with that. Never okay with the uncertainty of what's going to happen. And to this day, like, I don't know if I want to do private sector or if I want to go into academia. I don't know what my end goal is. But what I do know is the topics I'm interested in, the things I want to research are all possible in this and I never ever thought that that was and not only do I know that what I want to study is possible I finally believe that I'm a place that if I want to do this I can do this it's not about intelligence the PhD anyone will tell you it's persistence Mm. it's persistence and I completely completely agree with that for sure Mm. do you think you've identified what enough is I think I think enough is different for everyone. And so if you let your life be ruled by that idea, then it's never going to be enough. And it's realizing that enough looks different every day. That some days I'm going to have really amazing days and be really productive. And some days showering and making sure I'm eating is enough. And I think Mm. those two days equally bring me to the stability I'm at right now. Like you need both. You need the productive days, but you also need to be okay with the no productivity days. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because, like I said, to this day, like every single day, there's ups and downs, you know, it's a roller coaster every week. Mm -hmm. I have really great weeks. And then I go through weeks of I'm so depressed. And it's just constantly telling myself that all of these feelings are valid. And they are all temporary, because just as good as those highs were, Mm -hmm. just shows that those lows never stay either. Mm -hmm. So reminding me, myself of that helps i think Mm. have you would you say that this year you've defined what balance means more more yes but have i gotten it down no (laughs) no i think um i think this year has not gotten me necessary to balance but it's gotten me to acceptance Mm -hmm. And the next is balance. I think balance also looks different Mm -hmm. in different phases of your life. And sometimes by balancing, it it can look unbalanced. You know, I think you have to go through different phases. You can't work on everything at the same time. Like Like I've said, you can't be the best student and be in a perfect shape perfect shape and also you know making a bunch of like you can't do it all at the Mm. same time and sometimes you've got to only pick a couple things that you're going to focus on at a time Mm -hmm. and I think that's been really really helpful for me that I've gone through different phases where I'm focusing on different things and I've changed a lot I think in different phases in just a matter of weeks months my preferences what I want to do, they just change because it just depends on what I'm focusing on at the moment. I think Hmm. I can, I can, and I've said this before, I can feel the grace that you operate with towards yourself. I can, I can, I don't know. I think it's kind of a weird statement, but I can feel it. I feel the energy. I really do. I feel, I feel the love for yourself that you have. And the way that you speak and the way that you communicate and the way that you talk about your journey and the self-awareness is really something that I truly admire, that I aspire to be. From this conversation, I take that Mm -hmm. with me and I 100% want to incorporate that into my life. And I will say I'm, I'm working towards that, but hearing you speak about your journey, embracing and accepting what last year was for you and what it meant for you and how it's contributing to where you're going and loving that part of yourself is so just I've said beautiful so many times but it is so beautiful it's Mm -hmm. it's it's to be able to do that you really have to know yourself Mm -hmm. and I see it 
So I just, it's and inspiring. I, it's not even that you have to know who you are mm-hmm. or necessarily everything is in place or anything like that. It's just being okay with not knowing. Mm. Like it comes down to being okay with not knowing what's going to happen and trusting yourself that you're going to figure it out. And I mm. think that's how I created the love I have for myself right now because I really hated my life. Like I really was unhappy with who I was and I had no trust in myself. And I think I've been able to now really, really look at myself and realize how far I've come because there's so many times where I felt like there's no way I'm going to get out of this. There's, there's no way like things are going to get better. There's just no way. I I remember there were times like I drove home from school at like 9, 10 p.m. and I'd stay in the lot of my apartment building and sit there and cry. And I wouldn't move out of my car for like 30 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes. Like I couldn't leave my car. I had nothing, no motivation in my body to go to my, like in my house. I was so, so unhappy because I thought, I really thought like I was so not worthy I guess of everything that was happening in my life and now like it's just so different like I'm just so in awe of myself like I'm just so happy and you know just thinking of where I'm at and what I'm doing and how much I'm learning and knowing that where I'm coming from like just knowing that one generation jump like I said knowing that my dad got as much as a third grade level education and had to quit school and had to take care of his family. And my mom was one of 12, 13 siblings in Ecuador, super poor, who got married to someone who was over 20 years older than her, who was a stranger. Two days after meeting my dad, she got married to my dad and came to the U.S. because her family told her, you should leave. Like, you're you're going to be stuck here you're going to be poor we can't do anything else you should leave like you should take this opportunity and thinking i think a big thing for me has been thinking about that thinking of their jumps because what they went through is obviously nothing i have to go through but they can't understand the phd but what i do understand is what my dad did you know come to the united states completely starting a new life, what my mom did, marrying a stranger, <laughs> two days later, moving to the U.S. and creating a family with this stranger, and then having three kids who are really smart and who have done really, really good in life, and it's just, I don't know, it seems like a miracle, like, it just, I don't, I don't see how that's possible, and I know that there are so many families who have done so many things like that, or even more, and their kids have done even greater things, you know, um, And so, yeah, maybe our parents can't understand what we're doing now. We can't understand them as much. But I think what we can understand is the sacrifice they did and the jump they had to make and thinking of how scary that must have been for them, you know, like changing your life like that, how scary that must have been. And compared to them, me starting a PhD program, like, that's insane, Um And I just, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of what has happened. I'm in awe of how I was able to get out of what that mentality I was in last year. Um, I look back at it and it just, I think when I look at myself, I see my young self. I think I see my, the child in me and I see so many parts of me that are unhealed and by nurturing those feelings by really focusing in on myself and seeing what I'm lacking or what I feel like I'm lacking or being more in tune with my triggers and all of these different things have really just led me to be in awe of myself. And I'm just so, so grateful that I let myself feel every single one of my feelings that I didn't try to run away from it that I faced everything because I had nothing else to do like my only option was to face this right like I was like I either have to face this or like put myself into a mental institute and quit school because at this point I'm miserable and that takes a lot a lot of work 
that not a lot of people will see, you know? Um, it felt like I was searching for myself, you know, at the same time. And I just, I'm glad I can finally say that I am really proud of where I'm at. I am really proud of my persistence and what I've done to overcome some really, really hard challenges and that who knows, you know, what's going to happen. I could, you know, decide next month, next year that this still isn't the thing for me and I could leave. And I'm at a point where I, kn- I think what brings me peace is knowing that regardless of if I get this PhD, I have found passions and I have found things I want to do. And I have learned so much about myself that regardless of what happens, I'm going to be fine. I am going to be fine because I Every single time it's been me who's pulled myself out. And there are so many good parts to me and I'm only building myself up from here on now. And it just, if anything, makes me excited. Even if I don't know what exactly it's going to look like, what my future is going to be, I'm excited in knowing that it's going to be something and it's going to be something good. Even if I don't know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. You're such a motivating individual. I feel so pumped. (laughs) It's like 9 p.m., but I'm ready to go after everything. (laughs) I, 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 I have no words, and that's like my only part in this episode. Like, is to have words, and I have no words. I, I, I just. You're right. The generational jump that occurs there. I'm in awe of it i i am i believe in you so (laughs) we just met but i believe in you and everything that you will do it'll just be absolutely amazing and i would say the world is, is is incredibly blessed to have you and your soul here so i just I don't know why I'm holding my hands like this, but I just, I feel so pumped. (laughs) That Mm -hmm. is, uh, yeah, I can't even do my only, (sighs) my only, my only purpose here is to have words and I have nothing. Um, So I won't try to fill in the space. (laughs) What, what's next for you? What, what do you see in your future? What do you want? Who, who is Ashley Rojas becoming? So right now, I think I'm just really excited to get into research. Um, I think I'm realizing I'm narrowing in on the topics I'm interested in, and that's really, really exciting to me. And I'm ready for that next step. Um, I'll be teaching my own class at the university next year and I'll be starting my research and I'm going to a conference this weekend in New Orleans. Mm. My department is fully funding me Mm. to go to this conference in New Orleans and there's going to be some great seminars on migration and crime and labor markets and I'm just so excited about that and I think the reason I'm so optimistic is that for the first time in my life I am giving myself the space to learn. I'm not avoiding it. I'm not quitting early. I'm at a place where even when it's scary, I'm not freezing up like I was before and I'm taking it in and I'm using those opportunities and I'm trying to learn more. And so I think for my future, I'm excited to one day present present my own research um I've been presenting for my classes uh, other research papers of course and every time I do it I just keep thinking I can't wait to be like yeah this paper was written by me by the way yeah I did that (laughs) um and I think that's just so exciting I've I think I've always seen myself as I have to be in some kind of mentor kind of dynamic I never knew what that meant. And, you know, everyone growing up is like, I want to change the world, right? Like, everyone wants to change the world. 
And I was just like that. Like, I was like, I want to change it in some way. And I never knew how that role was going to come into my life. I knew that I was meant to mentor others and to lead others and to show people from backgrounds similar to mine of what's possible. But being really, really real with it, because I think you constantly hear this this conversation in academia recently that they're trying to diversify the field and they want to bring more not only women, but people of color and first gens, right? They want to give these people these opportunities, but then you're given this opportunity and you're still lacking so many resources. And that's the hardest part, I think, is realizing that there are people who are doing what I'm doing and don't have to worry about the financial strain, don't have to worry about how they're going to pay for their next, you know, month of rent, whatever it is. And I just keep seeing like every single time I go through something and I'm like, how is the world this out to get me? I just think all of this is just building my story. Like I think Mm. every single struggle, everything that I'm going through, it's only going to make me a better leader. Mm. And Mm. to one day perhaps be able to be who my mentor was to me for me to be able to be that for someone else like she's changed my life right she gave me an opportunity that most people wouldn't have you know most schools wouldn't have with my background my ex my expertise like my math skills like I did not come in prepared and I am where I'm at because of the mentors I've had in my life and I've had some really really great professors and teachers who have believed in me when I never believed in myself and God, it's just, it took every single one of them doing something for me to be where I'm at. And to one day potentially think that I could be that for someone, that I could show them that I'm coming from a similar background and what I've had to overcome and teach them and expose them to as much as I can. Like, that's my dream. You know, I want. I want people to know that, like, just because you weren't exposed to it early on doesn't mean that you can't be exposed to something new later on. And to show that it's okay that you don't know what you want to do yet at an early age and maybe people around you do or whatever it is. And so I really see myself filling a mentor capacity in some way for sure. Mm -hmm. And researching the topics I'm interested in Mm -hmm. um, and then just being more at peace with myself mentally. Um, my goal, I think, is to fill that mentorship in some aspect. I think I really want others from backgrounds like me to have someone to help them just like I've had the help I've had in my life. Where I am really is because of everyone I've had in my life. It has taken all of those professors and teachers to believe in me, even when I had no idea who I was, I had no belief in myself. And they are the reason I am where I'm at. They are the reason I have the opportunities I have and realized just the potential I had. And I think for a lot of people from our backgrounds, it's so hard for us to see our potential and to think that these big things are possible and I think it requires a lot a lot of support and a lot of help and a lot of exposure that for me has been through mentorship and if I could someday help someone simply because of what I've been through and what I've gone through is similar to what their life is like and it gives them some glimmer of hope that hey she kind of looks like me and maybe I could do something like that And like I said, I don't know if I, you know, want to go into the private sector or if I want to go into academia and be a professor, but it'd be kind of crazy if one day, you know, there is a Latino economics professor, you know, at USC. And I mean, we've had some, of course, but my experience, just the classes I've had, I was usually always around the guys in the econ classes. I, I didn't feel like I belonged in if maybe I could help someone in those classes, just show them that there is someone who looks like them in this field and it is possible regardless of what your background looks like. Yeah, like my dad has a third grade level education. I want you to know that and I want you to see that like what I've had to do to 
get myself to where I'm at. Um, and I'd love to fill that capacity for someone in some way. <laughs> I, I have a very strong level, if level is the word, of admiration for you as a person. Mm, um, as a latina professional woman but also just as a woman as a person as a person within my age group too i you inspire me in and to be better you inspire me to be a better woman Aww, like i love that <laughs> it's 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 beautiful your story is beautiful and and your ability to highlight your journey or highlight everything that has impacted your journey and the growth is amazing you're extremely well spoken and very good at storytelling i have felt extremely engaged this is most definitely one of my favorite episodes thus far um so i i really appreciate it i really appreciate your time and i really appreciate your energy i appreciate saying that i've appreciated talking to you and what you do and i think it just you know i think it shows that that's why I like talking about the growth, you know, because for me to be at a place where I can see the growth happening actively, like I'm in a current state of growth every single day. And to get to this point, it took getting to the really, really bad places. And so that's why I am so all about feeling every feeling, feeling all all of the really bad stuff and feeling all of the really good stuff, because you need all of that to shape who you are. So it's a powerful thing yeah. if you can get in tune with some of that. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I really appreciate it. Yeah. This is Ali, season two, episode six, with Ashley Rojas. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Ali. Our episodes are available on YouTube and Spotify. Visit Ali dot club to learn more about our mission, our team, and our guests. Follow us on social media, and as always. Atrévete a lo imposible.